Hello, welcome to Image Bearers. My name is Atoma Eji. We are now at the uh, third season, episode 17. So excited to have on the program uh, some awesome guests who wrote this book together, The Great Sex Rescue. So we have on the program, Sheila Gregor. Gregoire, close. Gregoire, and you just told me. <laughs> Rebecca Gregoire Lindenbach mm -hmm. and Joanna uh, Sawatsky. You got All it. Right. <laughs> wow, wow. I feel, like I'm, I feel like I'm speaking to people from another country. Yeah, yeah. we have like Mark. German and Austrian and French and yeah, it's a whole mix mm -hmm. <laughs> of That's names awesome. there. So I'm just going to read from the back of your book. It says, uh, based on groundbreaking in-depth uh, in survey of over 20,000 women, the great sex rescue pulls back the curtain on what, has, what is happening in Christian bedrooms and exposes the problematic evangelical teachings that wreck sex for so many couples while pointing couples to what they should have been doing all along. The great sex rescue is long overdue, a long overdue corrective to church culture, helping couples awaken the kind of intimacy and passion that God intended. Mm -hmm. You know, I read through this book, I think in two or three days or so, and there's just so much good stuff in here. I know uh, typically when I start the program, we do uh, kind of how's it going, a little bit get to know you, but there's so much I want to cover from this book <laughs> that I think we need to just go ahead and jump in. Sounds uh, great. We, so again, just welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank and you, you have a hardcover version. We haven't even seen the hardcover version yet. So that's, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> We also have on the program today, uh, Angela Barberg, who's assisting uh, with the interview. Uh, let's go ahead and dive right in with the first question. So your new book is called, again, The Great Sex Rescue. What does sex need rescuing from? If you can just start with that as a question. Well, I gotta tell a story to answer that one properly. So I have been blogging at to love, honor, and vacuum .com since 2008. And I started just doing like the mommy blog, parenting stuff. And then the more I talked about sex, the more my traffic grew. So in 2012, I wrote the good girl's guide to great sex. And I kind of transitioned into talking about sex all the time. And I became the Christian sex lady, which is weird, but there you go. And so I'm writing about sex all the time. We're creating courses on libido. I wrote a 31 day challenge for couples, 31 days to great sex. I'm creating all this content on how people can have great sex. Mm -hmm. And everybody still has the same problems. And we started to think, you know, maybe there's something going on behind the surface, like below the surface that we're not seeing that's actually the cause of these problems. And about two years ago, we actually started reading some of the best-selling sex and marriage books in the evangelical world, which I know sounds weird because you'd think I would have read them before, but I have this real fear of plagiarizing. So <laughs> I hadn't read, that. yeah, so I hadn't actually read these books. <laughs> and when I took a look, I realized, uh-oh, there's some really toxic stuff being taught here. So we decided to do something about it because we were worried that maybe this is the reason that people can't get free. So last year we did that huge survey. Joanna is our epidemiologist statistician person. So she did all the numbers. Rebecca is our psychometrics person, helped design the survey. And uh, we did this huge survey, 20,000 women, 130 questions minimum, took about 25 minutes at least. It was humongous to try to get to the bottom of what evangelical teachings, if any, were wrecking sex and marriage for women. Now, I think you started out with a smaller subset. You didn't start out with 20,000. And I think that didn't get enough attention, if I remember correctly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, well, what <laughs> happened was when, when the first book we looked at was Love and Respect. Okay. And we weren't planning on doing anything with it. I just opened it up. I read the sex chapter and I was really horrified because he said, if your husband is typical, he has a need you don't have. And he said that husbands need physical release through sexual intimacy and he needs physical release the way that you need emotional release. I don't actually know what emotional release is. Like that's a weird thing to say, but 
you know, but every man's battle was talking about sex as if it was only for the guy. Yeah, love and respect. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. sorry, love and respect. Love and respect. And so um, I wrote about this and we got so much feedback that we ended up doing a whole series on love and respect. We expanded it to the entire book and we just had so many stories of women's being abused because of that book. So yeah. Joanna, why don't you tell us what happened after that? <laughs> Hopefully the baby will not smack her tray. Um, and if she does, I will just start over. Um, yeah, so we got response after response after response. And I remember taking these calls from Sheila and Becca and I are young moms. We have little tiny babies. And so we're chatting as we're watching our little ones and the comments started just flooding in. And I looked at them and my training is in public health. And I was horrified because what I was seeing was health effects. And I said, okay, we've got to go through these. Or actually, I think Sheila actually asked me to go through the comments. And so I did. I did a quick qualitative analysis. We looked at the themes that were emerging from the different comments that we got. We got hundreds of stories. And then uh, did a quick write-up for the, later in the week. And then we went back through, again, more formally, got it ready for focus on the family. And we sent them a huge report going through all of the stories that we documented, just saying like, surely they just aren't aware of what's going on. Surely they'll listen to us. And we sent it off to focus. Sheila knew focus. She'd been on the program three times. Again, absolutely. They're going to get back to us. We'll get to the bottom of this. No big deal. But it was crickets. We waited and waited and waited and we never heard back. And I want to be clear, the comments that we got were not simply women saying, well, you know, my marriage was fine, but then I became a little bit more unhappy. That wasn't what we're talking about. We're saying um, abuse. What we're saying is physical abuse, marital rape, Mm -hmm. um, women becoming suicidal, women almost leaving the faith, women only coming back to the faith after they left their abusive husbands um, that they stayed with because of love and respect. We're talking earth shattering, world changing abuse. That yeah. was enabled by this book. And obviously I don't think that was the intention. No, mm-hmm. of course not. But we can't ignore the impact or at least that's what we thought, yeah. but they did. Yeah. yeah. But and so did. we thought, okay, well, if you won't listen to us with several hundred, we got to go big. So it's like, go big <laughs> or go home. We right. decided to do a huge survey and really get to the bottom of all this. So you surveyed uh, 20,000 women for your book, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so why were women the focus? Women were the focus. Yeah, I'll take this one. So the reason women were the focus is because of something that's been documented in peer reviewed literature for a long time, which is the orgasm gap. Okay, so the orgasm gap is the difference between how often a man will orgasm versus how often a woman, a woman will orgasm in a sexual encounter in their marriage. So like we kind of expect men tend to orgasm 95% to 100% of the time. They're very, they get there, right? They have a good time. They have sex. The man is going to finish. Mm -hmm. But women, on the other hand, literature is found don't have a 95% orgasm rate. Shocker. I know. Right. Um, but what we found in our survey of 20,000 women, which is echoed in the peer reviewed literature, which we had reviewed beforehand is women had Mm -hmm. around a, uh, 48% orgasm rate, um, Mm -hmm. whereas men have around a 95% in the modern literature, Mm -hmm. which means we have an orgasm gap of like over 40%. It's, um, Mm -hmm. someone do the quick mental math. 47, 40, 47%, um, orgasm gap. And that's a big gap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what we were trying to do with the survey is figure out how can we close that? right? How can we have it so that marriages have sex that is truly mutual, that is mutually pleasurable, that is mutually giving? Mm -hmm. Um, Because if we can figure that out and we have more orgasmic women, Mm -hmm. frankly, probably a lot of the other issues with sex are going to get better too, right? Mm -hmm. She doesn't have a libido, but she also never orgasms. So which came first? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that was such an easy... um, it's such an easy number to look at because it's so clear. It's like, are you orgasming sometimes, most of the time, never Mm -hmm. Um, like which. uh, And so when we are looking at the outcome variables, it's, Mm -hmm. it's just a nice statistic that we can compare and show this is how women are being left in the dust. And that was never what God intended. And so how can we rescue sex for women and therefore rescue sex for couples? 
Yeah. Because the biggest, the biggest challenge that couples report, and these aren't the only ones, no, of course but not. the top, the top challenges that couples tend to say is she doesn't want sex and she doesn't enjoy sex. So yeah. if we could figure out the root cause of those things, we can call, we can cure a lot of the issues, not all of them, but let's take care of the big ones. And then we can start dealing with the other ones. Okay. So this may, you may answer this with this next question. Otherwise I may have a, a follow-up, but your book uh, basically goes through and explores a, a lot of different things, but what would you say is the most damaging, widely, wildly held, widely held belief about sex and marriage uh, espoused by the evangelical culture, and why is it so damaging? I kind of have a two-part one on that. So okay. I would think that the most, what we, what we found is that the most damaging belief is that a wife is obligated to have sex with her husband when mm -hmm. he wants it. But before I even go into why, I think we need to back up a minute and ask, what do we mean when we say the word sex? <laughs> because this is part of the problem. Like when we say sex, if I were to ask people, you know, did you have sex last night? People are picturing something very <laughs> specific in their head, you know, and it's something to do with, did he put his thing into her and move around until he climax? Like what they're describing is intercourse. You know, that's how we tend to think of sex. But if that's our definition, then she could be lying there counting ceiling tiles, making a grocery list in her head. She could even be in pain or she could be in emotional turmoil and it would still mm -hmm. count as having sex. And what we would contend is that that is not the biblical definition of sex. Because when you look at the Bible, we see in Genesis 4, the verse, Adam knew his wife Eve and they conceived a son. And we tend to laugh at that verse and think it's just archaic language, like God's embarrassed of saying the real word. But really the word to know there, that Hebrew word is also used in the Psalms when David says, search me and know me, O God. Mm -hmm. It's this deep intimacy. And I think God was telling us that sex isn't just physical. It is this deep longing to be connected. That's why God uses sexual imagery to talk about his relationship with us. You know, that it is this longing for intimacy. So we know sex is intimate and personal. From Song of Solomon, we know that it's pleasurable. And from 1 Corinthians 7, we know that it's mutual. So biblically, sex is intimate, it's pleasurable, and it's mutual. And if you understand all three of those things, then one-sided intercourse, when she's just lying there, doesn't count as sex. Mm -hmm. And yet what we've been told, and we looked at so many evangelical bestsellers in our study to see how they were talking about sex. And over and over again, they used 1 Corinthians 7 to say, you know, do not deprive each other means she can't say no to intercourse. Mm -hmm. But if it's one-sided intercourse, she is already being deprived. And that's what's not being talked about. <laughs> um, and when you, when you look at the effects of that message, um, that women have to have sex out of obligation, you know, that message has the same effect, virtually the same effect on sexual pain as prior sexual trauma does. It's almost statistically the same. So it's like our bodies interpret that obligation sex message in the same way as trauma, because both of them say, you don't matter. Your needs don't matter. He has the right to use you. Yeah. And that's the thing I was going to have as, a, as kind of like a follow-up, which is, it seems to me as I was going through your book, you, you kind of um, uh, helped explain the, the fact that a lot of the books that are written from you know, whether it's Love and Respect or Every Man's Battle or, or other books like that are basically uh, designed for the men to be satisfied rather than a mutual, mm -hmm. uh, you know, enjoyment of one another. And I think that is a very damaging teaching where I think you even shared that there were people who, you know, perhaps started out having more of a, you know, let's have a mutual relationship, but then they read the books and it totally <laughs> twisted their thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to? Yeah. And I, and I think this actually comes back to the, I mean, the title of this podcast image bearers, right. Is do we see both men and women as image bearers of Christ or as, you know, pawns to get what we want. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I think what can often happen in well-meaning marriages 
is, you know, you start off and you're wanting this mutuality, you're wanting this, this pleasure, but then maybe something gets in the way. Maybe you're surprised by painful sex on the wedding night. Maybe, you know, you're trying and she's just not orgasming. Maybe her libido is really low. And so you start reading marriage books. And instead of offering this picture of, you know what, mutuality is the priority. They give you right. a shortcut. They give you a shortcut to getting frequent sex, right? Because what they do is they tell a woman, you know, you promise to have sex two to three times a week for the rest of your life. And if you don't, don't hours. even bother getting married. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think it's Kevin Lehman, I think in um, Sheet Music where he says I that he advises couples who are getting married, if you aren't willing to commit to having sex two to three times a week for the rest of your life, don't even bother getting married yeah. at all. And he includes yeah. her period in that. Yeah, that's what and we find postpartum. So, yeah. Yeah. And because he just says it's okay though, because she can just offer other sexual favors if she can't have intercourse. Yeah. And And the other thing about that is it was just only a physical thing rather than all the other aspects that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. And that's, I think, where it comes back to how are we seeing each other? Are we seeing each other as beloved children of Christ, as image bearers of God, you Mm -hmm. know, or are we seeing each other as, you know, means to an end? Yeah. And and often that end, like for instance, in every man's battle, it it talks so much about how men are in this constant battle with lust. And so there's one place where it says, you know, men's eyes are clouded by lust. And so, um, you know, do the right thing and give him release. Mm -hmm. So again, it's focusing on her giving him physical release so that he doesn't lust. And that has nothing to do with intimacy that erases the relationship. And that just dehumanizes her and objectifies her. And also dehumanizes men. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, no, there's so much good stuff in here. Okay, we got to keep going. We got to keep going. <sighs> All right. You also mentioned you alluded to this a little bit that Christian women have twice the rate of sexual pain disorders as a general population, which is very sad. Um, did you find a particular cause for this in your survey? Yeah, Joanna. Do you want to take this one? Sure, absolutely. So yeah, a Christian women have had that's it's been documented that Christian women have a high rate of sexual pain for a long time. Um, we found studies going back to the 1970s. So this is this is our problem. But what we don't find is that Christian resources are talking about this problem. Um, sp- we looked on Focus on the Family's website, for example, while we were writing our book, and we did a quick search for vaginismus and absolutely nothing popped up. We found one article that mentioned postpartum sexual pain in passing, um, but it wasn't even the focus of the article. And yet 20% uh, of women in our survey had experienced significant um, sexual pain unrelated to childbirth. It's a big segment of the population. Um, As far as causes go, vaginismus is a very a multifaceted problem. So it can be caused by posture issues. It can be caused by Mm -hmm. abuse, but it can also be caused by certain conservative beliefs, especially the obligation sex message. We found that the idea of needing to have duty sex was very correlated with experiencing vaginismus. And especially when women believe that before they're married. And that was really quite sad to see. Oh, yeah how much a theological idea can actually affect women's bodies. And again, like Mm -hmm. for me, I I came at this project as someone in public health. Um, We started the project because we thought there might be health effects from the way we're talking about sex in the church and we were able to document them. And so I just, I'm really hopeful that, that the church stops and listens and goes, wait a minute, is this what we want? Is what we want to, to center men's physical release so much and and make the cost of male pleasure women's pain Mm -hmm. yeah and and what's what's interesting too about that is that we all know what erectile dysfunction means you know you watch any game show you will see a commercial for erectile dysfunction medication Mm -hmm. but very few people know the word vaginismus and yet for people in their 20s and 30s vaginismus is far more common yeah And so we need to, we need to make this a regular thing we talk about Mm -hmm. um, because it is something that a lot of people struggle with. Yeah. And I will say, you know, Christian sources are super comfortable talking about um, sexual dysfunction in men. 
Mm -hmm. Um, you know, even that search that Joanna did on focus on the family for vaginismus, we also searched for erectile dysfunction and a lot of stuff came up. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's not that we're not willing to talk about this as a culture. It's that as a Christian culture, we have, in our opinion, looking at the literature, we've, we've downplayed women's experiences, um, because Mm -hmm. we've, um, so focused on men's and we just need to focus on both. Yeah. One does not need to suffer at the expense of the other. Both matter. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not really sure how the evangelical world feels right now. I know that's a very general statement. There's many pockets of the evangelical world, yeah. but I think they're getting rocked by so mm-hmm. many, in so many fronts, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think your book is just another level, another area that they just really need to review just some of the teachings that have come out, you know, from, from their world. So thank you. Thank you for the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to pass it on, pass it on right now to Angela. All right. So one of the questions we had was, uh, you start out the book by saying that one of the big problems leading to terrible sex is that we define sex incorrectly or wrong. So what do you mean by that? Yeah, so mostly what we do is we define sex in terms of intercourse and in terms of his pleasure, like we center it around him. And instead of centering it around both of us. And we, what we found really difficult was how many evangelical resources really talked about how much a man needs sex. And they just didn't talk or even assume that a woman would have a sex drive. Very generalized. Because, because mm-hmm. like, think about it. If you're a girl in the church and you grew up in the church and you hear your whole life, you don't need sex, he does. You know, he's going to want sex. You're not going to want sex. And we do know that this starts as early as 10, 11, 12, when girls are first told about the modesty message about how all boys want one thing. And you don't know how boys think because you're a girl and you don't think like this. Yeah. Right. Right? How many of us were told that before we even hit double digits in age for Pete's sake. And so we need to understand the concept of self-fulfilling prophecy. You tell girls from the time they're small, you don't need sex but he does and sex is about what he wants, then no wonder she's not gonna want sex. But the other issue is that if we define sex as only intercourse, what we miss out on is the fact that the majority of women who do reach climax need more than intercourse. I think it's around 30% of women who do reach climax can reach it through intercourse alone, but everybody else needs foreplay and quite a bit of it. And and I also wanna say that's can. That's not usually does. That's yes. can. Mm-hmm. So s- only 30% can reach climax through intercourse alone. Yeah. We didn't want to ask that many questions about specifically how women orgasm because it was just, it's just hard to ask about. Um, Sheila wanted to put in a ton more questions and I was <laughs> like, I'm so sorry, but no. <laughs> um, all we can say is that only 30% can and I suspect mm-hmm. that it's a far smaller yeah. number who do regularly yeah. climax through intercourse alone. And so if most women find other sources of sexual pleasure, a more reliable route to orgasm, and yet we interpret intercourse as sex, then a lot of women will feel like I'm being selfish if I ask for something else. Or I'm broken. Or I'm broken if intercourse doesn't do it for me. And that's what we found over and over again is so many women felt like I am broken and my body doesn't work properly. And what we're missing is, hey, God created our bodies to work in a different way. Like women have a body part. The the only purpose is pleasure. And yet that body part is best stimulated in ways other than intercourse. So this is actually God's design for us that men would have to take some time focusing on women. That's the way God made our bodies to work. And yet that hasn't been the message that's been conveyed to couples. Right. Yeah. I really appreciate, uh, I appreciate what you're saying with that. Um, What would you say is the one important topic that the other best-selling sex and marriage books are leaving out uh, that that you included in your study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really big one. And this one was really shocking to us. When we did our review, we actually, we did our our survey of 20,000 women. We identified teachings that were harmful, but we also did a systematic review of the current bestsellers in marriage and sexuality 
um, in Christian literature, as well as um, some kind of like staple Mm -hmm. culture forming books that Mm -hmm. aren't bestsellers anymore, but they were at their time. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And we rated them on this rubric that we did. That was a 12 point rubric of healthy sexuality that was based on mutuality, pleasure, and um, fidelity. Fidelity. Thank you. But there was one question that uh, none of our Christian resources got a full mark on, and that was consent. Consent. Yep. That Mm -hmm. was consent. Yep. And that was shocking because not only did they not get full marks, um, we will say John Gottman's book, um, which is our secular control, the seven principles for making for, for, for making, making marriage, marriage work. work. Yep. Thank you. I always get his two book titles completely mixed <laughs> up. Sorry. Um, that one did actually score really well in consent. It had a lot of information, but the Christian books didn't. Yeah. Now boundaries in marriage was good. Yes. Like boundaries in marriage did talk about how you can have boundaries around your sex life. It's certainly okay to take sex off the table if you're not yeah. being treated well, but there just wasn't that robust conversation of what does consent actually mean? Yeah. And gift of mm-hmm. sex was the penners really, was great. was too. really good too. Like it did talk about how, you know, intercourse should be at her invitation, but what it didn't talk about was sometimes she might Sometimes her invitation is coerced. Sometimes her invitation is coerced. And so what does coercion look like in the bedroom? What does pressure look like in the bedroom? What does real real consent look like? And no one talked about that, but you know what they did talk about? (laughs) A lot of our books had illustrations of marital rape, but didn't Mm -hmm. call them that. Right. Or else they did call it marital rape, but they said they acted as if it was totally normal or fine Mm -hmm. because at least he was having sex. Um, You know, there was a horrific example in Tim LaHaye's book, The Act of Marriage, um, that was first published in the 70s, but we were looking at the most recent edition, which was from the late 90s. Mm -hmm. which marital rape was illegal (laughs) everywhere. Well, not everywhere, but but most places. Yeah. It was illegal enough that it should have have been been a red flag. And he had, he tells a story of Aunt Matilda um, who says that on her wedding night, you know, she was, it was the old days where she was married off to a man 20 years her senior. And LaHaye um, describes him as bumbling and clumsy and um, Mm -hmm. kind of just kind of shows him as a little bit of of a fool. But he says that Matilda was like screaming and kicking and her husband raped her on her wedding night Mm -hmm. and continued to do so her whole marriage but what was the moral of the story lahey called aunt matilda the problem in essence because she was telling her niece who was getting married that in her mind marriage is just legalized rape and what what tim lahey says is matilda and her equally (sighs) unhappy husband Mm -hmm. Her equally unhappy husband. That's how he describes them. Yeah. Because we don't understand consent in marriage. Yeah. And I will say we did a follow-up survey. We um, let people give us their emails and kind of mention what kinds of topics they would be interested in talking to us about. And we had hundreds of women who signed up to talk to us about stories of marital rape. Yeah. About 20% of the people who gave us their emails had stories of marital rape to share. And when you look at the messages in these books, the messages like he has a need you don't have, you can never possibly understand how much he needs sex. If you don't have sex, he's going to watch pornography or have an affair and it's going to be partially your fault. Cause after all faithfulness is a two way street, right? Right. Um, that's Kevin, Lehman. that's Kevin Lehman and she's yeah. music, by the way, <laughs> you know, you yeah. have these, these, um, examples where women are told you're not allowed to say no to sex, but they're not told. And by the way, he's also not allowed to rape you. Yep. And so you get stories like the woman who we talked to in our focus groups who said in describing her first marriage, I got really good at running and slamming doors behind me and locking them and curling up in a ball to protect myself because her husband would physically break down doors to rape her. And she read these books. Unconditional respect was the other one, right? From love and respect. Yeah. Un- and respect mm. and sex is a part of respecting your husband yeah. in love and respect. Right. And women are asked to give yeah. it unconditionally. Even mm-hmm. if he has withering rage to yeah. the point that you need to get away and hide, or even if he's drinking and straying. <sighs> and yeah. this is the problem is I think, and we were talking to, you know, we, we've talked about this with a bunch of people who are also in the industry and who are also working through this. And, and there was um, one woman who I can't remember exactly who it was, who said that 
The problem is when we keep on telling people just have sex until you're married, there's no need for a conversation about consent because <laughs> any sex before you're married is sinful, right? And so when it's all sinful, mm. we don't we don't separate it into something that is not wise and sinful to do versus something that is actually victimizing. Mm -hmm. What is the difference, right? In, in this whole purity culture mindset of just don't do it, it's all in the same boat. But that's not true, right? There's some sin that is sin and there's some sin that is evil and uses and harms people in a whole other way. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to be clear that rape can happen even in marriage yes. and everything. And, and you don't own a person because you gave but, them a ring. But, and the other problem is it's not even just in marriage. Like, no. um, like Shanti Feldon's book for young women only. Um, she said that 82% of teenage boys feel little ability and have little response or feel little responsibility and have little ability to stop the sexual progression. And so if you want to stop, it's better to not even start. Yep. She then also says that boys need you to help mm -hmm. them stop because they can't do right. it on their own. And so we talked to a number of women who were victims of date rape as teenagers, but they didn't recognize it at the time because, you know, because they, they felt that, it was their fault. And, and often the very words that they had read in this book were parroted back to them. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's just really problematic is that we aren't giving both women and men yes. a proper way to look at this. And then if you just, I mean, to make it a little bit less, this is, this is depressing to make it just a little bit more <laughs> succinct, you know, and bring it back to sexual pleasure. What we found over and over again is that women feel like if you can't truly say no, it's, mm. you can't truly say yes. And yeah. when women feel the ability to say no, it's like yeah. everything switches in their brain and suddenly yeah. I can have sex because I want to. And that's when they become orgasmic. That's when libido kicks back in. We need to give people permission to say no. Yeah. I, it's really interesting because um, I've been married for over 28 years and um, my husband and I met at church. We did have a pure dating relationship. Um, and that was one of the books I read was the LaHaye book. And I was just like, okay, Bill the Beast. I mean, it was just like, okay. But it just was like. Bill, he is, he was yeah. a beast. Yes. But I, I see why you drowned the book. So, yeah. I, so <laughs> I've read all those books. I've read Love and Respect. I've read the sheet music. I've read all those different books. And yeah, they're mostly written by men. And so when Atoma actually was the one, what, about three weeks ago? It was the first week in March. And he mentioned it um, in uh, Facebook. And then I had another friend that mentioned it as well. And so I picked it up. I, I did my Kindle. I read it in three days. And I was uh -huh. like, wow, eye-opening. And, of course, your, your uh, blog or your uh, podcast yeah. So my husband and I have been discussing it and it's been really great. So, but it's something that like what you're doing is you're telling people, you know, making sure you know your resources so that, mm -hmm. you know, other young marrieds uh, don't come into that information mm -hmm. and, and get really skewed uh, mindset. Well, yeah. and I think that idea of a skewed mindset for me, this is actually a lot of what we're doing is giving people permission to just go after the marriage that they know they want. Yeah. Right. Because how many men, you know, and I'm, I'm implying the answer is very, very few actually want to go into a marriage with a woman who doesn't feel they can say no to have sex, who only yeah. has sex because she feels she has to, who, um, you know, will begrudgingly give sexual favors on her period because she feels obligated to do so. Like that does not sound mm -hmm. fun, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like most men, when they get married, do not want the kinds of sex lives these books are prescribing to their wives. So yeah, all we're trying to say, well, that's exactly it. Yeah. It's like, and frankly, <laughs> if you do, I'm not really yeah. If, if you do want that kind of thing, then I think you've already beaten these books to it. Yeah. Um, but I think that what we're doing with this book, I hope is giving the, is giving permission to the people in the pews to just have discernment again. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, just mm -hmm. saying you, you have the spirit, like, you know, yeah. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so you're allowed to question people. Yeah. You're allowed to say, this doesn't sound like anything I'm interested in. And you're not a bad Christian for doing so. Mm -hmm. In fact, we just want to empower people to be able to think about yeah. this critically and, and read books and think, wait, 
is this actually how I want my spouse to think about sex? Because it's often hard to think about it for ourselves, isn't it? Because we, we're so critical of ourselves and we, we can often write ourselves off. Like, well, maybe I'm just not good enough. Mm -hmm. But if we think about it from the perspective of, is this what you would want someone telling your sister, telling your daughter someday, mm -hmm. you know, telling or your best telling friend, your son or telling your son, because the lust right? to men the is lust, terrible too. It's truly <laughs> yeah. terrible. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I think that if we just give people permission to look at things with mm -hmm. an open heart and open eyes and to not blindly trust everything with a Christian label. Mm -hmm. Yes. I actually think yes. a lot of marriages would have been spared a lot of harm because I think a lot of marriages are with two very good, well-meaning people who get led astray by thinking maybe we're not holy enough because we don't have a marriage like what's described in these books. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's great. Uh, so it says that um, the harmful beliefs that you measured are common beliefs in the evangelical cultural world but you wouldn't necessarily call them Christian beliefs. So what would you say are the Christian beliefs about sex? Well, you know, we've, we've talked about how sex should be mutual, pleasurable and intimate, but what we do throughout the book is we take these beliefs that are often just talked about as if they're there, well, they're just in the water in the evangelical world. And we show how you can reframe them and rescue them. So let me just give you an example. One of the beliefs that we found that was really harmful is the idea that all men struggle with lust. It's every man's battle, Yeah. right? There's been book series written about that. Um, it's a major point in many of our books. Yeah. Yes, that, that wives, you can be the methadone. You can be like a merciful vial of methadone for him when he's quitting cold turkey, which is just a terribly dehumanizing thing to say. But, you know, instead of saying that, why don't we just shift it to something which is more biblical and accurate? So instead of saying all men struggle with lust, it's every man's battle, we can say something like many people struggle with lust. Right. And often men more than women, but many women do too, but it is not a struggle that you can't overcome. And it should not mm. be a lifelong struggle because with the Holy Spirit, he can renew you. And the way that you defeat lust is by learning to treat others as image bearers of God. Yep. You know, image and bearers. We, image bearers. Yeah. There you go. We just because, love the title, honestly. Because <laughs> it all comes back to that. It all comes back to that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Let's not make sex something which is dehumanizing and objectifying, but instead make sex which is something which is life giving, mm -hmm. which is the way that God meant for it to be. Yeah. And I just want to cut in real quick. I think like for me, as I'm listening to this conversation, it's actually a very mm -hmm. awkward conversation <laughs> that, that, that does, it does not typically happen, you know? Yeah. Right. And I think, so I think for me, what I can say is just thank you for, for, you know, allowing this conversation to happen because the reality is it, it is happening, but it's just happening in the dark, quote unquote. Right. You know? mm -hmm. And totally. although this is yeah. like a very hard topic to speak about in some senses, I'm glad that you guys are bringing it to light mm -hmm. so that people, you know, can really get the help that they need and really just have the marriages that God designed for them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I love how you said it's already being talked about in the dark. So that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Yep. That's very cool. Uh, so what is your hope for your book? Oh, we just hope <laughs> that people will read it with an open mind and find freedom. And yeah. we have just heard so many great stories from women who said, you know what? I read this thinking that I didn't need it. I read this just because I follow your blog and I love you and I'm just wanting to support you. And I read this and I'm like, oh my goodness. I didn't realize how many things I had internalized. Yeah. And I didn't realize how many negative messages I'm carrying. But you know, I went through that. Like even mm -hmm. looking at our survey results, I changed my own thinking on so many things and I've had to deconstruct more. And that's a good thing. You know, that's a good thing to push all of us more towards a Jesus centered view of our, of our sexuality and, and marriage. And so, yeah, I hope that women will have that. I hope that men will have that. Uh, many couples are reading this together and mm -hmm. just having great conversations. Yeah. Um, but then I also just really hope and pray that our ministry leaders and our pastors will start thinking about what resources they recommend yeah. and will also give permission to their parishioners 
to have discernment. Because one of the good things we found that I think is, is hopeful for pastors is that most people did not report hearing these really terrible things from their pastors. They, rep- they, right. they, they heard it from books and, and from resources media. and from media. Yeah. And Christian media. I mean, not so, secular. So a pastor could be doing an amazing job. They could, they could have like the totally good view of sex, totally healthy, but then right under their nose, people are doing marriage studies and women's Bible studies and conferences where they're getting these negative messages. Yeah. yeah. So our hope and prayer is just that ministry leaders will be more discerning. will go through their church libraries and will say from the pulpit, you know what? Just because something says it's Christian doesn't mean it's Jesus centered. And we need to all be like the Bereans Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we need to, we need to take what we learn and we need to measure it against scripture. And we just want to say too, we are not the end of this conversation. No, we're wanting to start the conversation, but we don't want to end it because we're not there yet. None of us are there yet. (laughs) We're still on this side of heaven. We've all got more growth to do, but let's start having this conversation and let's allow people to say, you know, I'm not sure if that's right. Instead of being so tense about anyone challenging us, let's allow people to challenge us because that's where growth happens. And let's have these discussions. They're important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For me, for me personally as well, um, being a mom of a boy, who is 18 months old now, almost. Mm. Um, my hope for the book is that Joanna and me, our kids grow up in a healthier church than we did. We grew up in the middle of purity culture. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. yeah. We grew up, I heard at all of the youth group events, mm. you know, about how we had to dress so that the boys would be able to focus at the conferences. Um, and I just want my son to be raised in a church who doesn't expect him to become a predator with his first chest hair. Um, you know, I want, right. mm-hmm. I want my son to be in a church who sees him as capable of being an honorable man of God. And for that, not to come with an asterisk. Um, I want my son to be in a church who sees him not as a problem or as a threat to women, but as a protector and as a benefit to society and not in spite of his sexual sin struggles, but because he is someone who is, you know, a son of the King because he is a person. And that's what I want for my children's generation, because I don't want to have to be in a church that sees our kids as predators simply because they're male. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I just have one more question on my side. So is there a way to reframe the way the evangelical church mm-hmm. uh, talks about sex so that's healthier? Yes. Yeah. I just think we need to center it around intimacy. I think that's the key word because everything flows from that. And intimacy not being a shorthand for sex. Yes, we all think (laughs) it's the same thing. They're not. What I mean by intimacy is that deep knowing of each other. Because when you know each other, it means both of you matter. Mm -hmm. And if both of you matter, if we're honoring both of you, then all the rest will fall into place (laughs) about the fact that her pleasure matters too, about the fact that, you know, both of you should have libidos for each other, like all of that will fall into Mm -hmm. place. But it has to be centered not around physical release, (laughs) not around that, but around truly knowing each other, because that's where passion comes. And that's where everything else will flow. And I think when we're looking at our current advice, I'm going to be honest, a really quick little um, litmus test is if you can't easily make it apply to both genders, mm-hmm. it's probably a little bit off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So, you know, if we have all this stuff where like, if your husband is typical, he has a need you don't have. And also if your wife is typical, she has the same need that you don't have. Wait, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like yeah. logically that falls apart, right. but we do know scientifically, we know that both men and women need sex. So if it can't, be applied to both with these kind of overarching ideas of libido, you know, like mm-hmm. husbands can have the higher libido, wives can have the higher libido. So why do we talk about it? Like it's always a husband's issue. That's why I think if we as a church get back to talking about these things mm-hmm. in, in terms of a principle that can be applied in either circumstance, mm-hmm. we will stop having this male entitlement um, mentality and evangelicalism with sex. And instead it will be something that is more balanced and where both men and women are honored in the conversation versus Mm -hmm. it being one-sided. And if advice doesn't work, 
for both, then ask why. And if it's because of postpartum sex, then well, maybe that makes a little bit of sense because <laughs> um, there's only one going through a partum. Um, but <laughs> with, with everything else, it, it doesn't make sense for it to only work one way. So yeah. why are we giving that kind of advice? Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask one last question. Um, I know that uh, I think Rebecca, you kind of helped put together this rubric. It was um, mostly yes. We all we all helped on everything, yeah. um, okay. but with the with the research, uh, my mom really did the the rubric pretty <laughs> intensely. <laughs> okay, so I think the three components, just real quick, was infidelity and lust. That's one component. Pleasure mm -hmm. and libido is another, and then mutuality. Yes. And you kind of have a bunch of questions. I think it's four questions for each section. Yep. You rate graded them each book from zero to four, I think it is. Yep. Okay. And then you came up with a score. And so you had um, on page 246, you have a list of looks like 14 books here that mm -hmm. you kind of went through and you grouped them into helpful books, neutral books, and harmful books. Can you just maybe just go through uh, those books and kind of what you found in general? Yeah. yeah. First of all, our rubric is only about the teachings about sex in these books. So we're really not measuring them based on what they say about like marriage or theology in general. We're just <laughs> looking at it based on like yeah. our results from our survey and other yeah. peer reviewed literature in regards to sex, particularly just. Yeah. So, so in the that first case, thing... you left off the five love languages because it yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Exactly. So we, we, we looked at the top 10 marriage books um, on Amazon on a particular date that were not new releases. Like like, so it wasn't a blip that they were high up, you yeah, know? Right. Um, and then three of those books didn't talk about sex. So we excluded them. And then we looked at the the top six or si the six iconic sex books that had done the most, that had the most influence in the evangelical world. Um, and in our rubric, we want to say it was very possible to score well. Yes. Because mm -hmm. John Gottman, Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, scored 47 out of 48, near perfect. That's so, so, that's so good, but so sad at the same yeah, but time. So, but so did The Gift, the gift of, sex. of Sex by the Penners. Also scored 47 out of 48. Yeah. Very, very good book. Um, highly recommend. And then two other books also, no, three other books also scored in the 40s. Um, Gary Thomas's Sacred, or, yeah, Sacred Marriage, Rich. Boundaries in Marriage by Cloud and Townsend, and Intimate Issues by Dillo and what's Pintus. Pintus. Oh, yeah. Pintus. Um, Pintus. Yes. So those, so those books scored really well. So it was possible to score well. <laughs> it wasn't like yeah. this was, it wasn't like this was out of reach. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, but every other book did not make the helpful category. Yeah. Uh, there were two that were neutral. The Meaning of Marriage by Tim Keller and Intended for Pleasure by The Wheats. Um, but all of the other bestsellers scored harmful. Yeah, and that includes Sheet Music by Kevin Lehman, um, mm -hmm. The Act of Marriage by Tim and Beverly LaHaye, The Power of a Praying Wife by Stormy, Stormy O'Martian, His Needs, Her Needs by Willard Harley, For Women Only by Shanti Felton, Every Man's Battle by Steve Arterburn and Fred Stoker, and Love and Respect by Emerson. And, and Love and Respect literally scored zero. Wow. So, and, and I, yeah. and I'll, and I'll clarify our rubric went from, yeah, from zero to four for everything, zero or one meant that they actively promoted a teaching that was actively harmful to women. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that they didn't say the the helpful stuff is that they actively promoted something harmful. They got a two if they just didn't really mention it. <laughs> yeah. Um, they got a three if they had something healthy and then they got a four if they got, if they said a healthy teaching and then also counteracted the negative teaching. Mm -hmm. So in essence, if you got a four, you were actively helping people find freedom in that area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, if you got a three, you were just beneficial. Um, if you got a two, you just didn't really talk about it. If you got a one or a zero, you were actively making things worse. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And the best-selling Christian book on that is love, and is love and respect, which scored the zero. Yeah, that's scary. Yep. Yeah. But I don't know what's so hard because I mean there are helpful things in all of these books. Totally. Read, mm -hmm. Right. Totally. But the overwhelming message is one that's negative when you take it in balance. Well, and that's as it relates to sex. 
Well, yeah. and that's what happens, right? Cause you know, we're not like these, and I'm saying uh, my whole thing is I want to give people back the, the gift, like the ability to discern and permission, but people are not dumb, right? Like we're not going to read a book that actively says your wife should not enjoy sex. And if you are enjoying sex then you are doing something wrong, like we're not going to read those books. Right. Mm -hmm. But what happens is they have enough good information and enough kind of helpful sounding tips that it kind of tricks you a bit. They're actually, I find these books quite slippery, right? Because mm -hmm. they say all these things that sound right, but then they have these harmful, insidious messages kind of woven throughout, which is why, you know, I think this is why we're told to be like shrewd <clears throat> in our dealings with kind of teachings. Like Paul instructs us to be shrewd. It was Paul, I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> I get some of the letters in the t New Testament mixed up. Jesus but. says it too, just Jesus straight up. Yeah. Shrewd as yeah, okay. and innocent as doves. That's thank right. you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Joanna. Um, no but problem. I think, I think that's what we need to recognize is often we look at a book and we don't ask, is there harmful stuff here? What we ask is, does this make sense to me? Right. But we're all flawed people, right? So what makes sense to us is not always what's healthy. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to ask is how would this affect a woman who is in an emotionally abusive relationship? Mm -hmm. How would this affect someone who is, you know, scared that their spouse is actively having an affair and is trying to find a way to fix it? Um, would this put the guilt on the injured party or would this free them? Um, mm -hmm. If we ask those kinds of questions, like how would this affect a woman who's experiencing sexual pain? How yeah. would this affect a man who is, um, you know, has um, hidden sexual abuse that he hasn't disclosed yet? Because that's a lot of men's stories. Yeah. You know, how would this affect people who are the vulnerable? How would this affect, you know, the one lost sheep who's gone astray? Does this go and seek them out and bring them back? Or does it simply push them further into further into mm -hmm. the wilderness. And those mm -hmm. are the kinds of questions we yeah. need to ask. And, and the other thing, we often get pushback saying, well, I know the book might harm some, but it's really helped a lot. But I just want to say boundaries in marriage does not harm anyone. Yeah. The gift of sex right. did not harm anyone. This idea that so many evangelicals have that, well, you know, just read the book. You don't need to like all of it, but he says some good stuff. Nobody else does that. Like even we, we've set the bar way too low. It is, right. it is absolutely not true that every book harms a little bit. No, it's not. True. I don't think the great sex rescue is harmful, <laughs> but, but you know, when we, when we had an open-ended question asking women, which books have helped you and which books have harmed you or organizations or whatever, there were many, many resources that were never mentioned as harmful. Mm -hmm. And then there were a lot of resources that were in both categories. Because the harmful stuff, it's not like it's only harmful, right? Love and respect is a bestseller because a lot of people, it helps them, but it's also the number one harmful book. And so we need to start having more discernment and realize, hey, if a book harms a few people, it's probably not good because well, <laughs> there mean, are others that don't harm. So let's, let's look at the books that don't harm. The metaphor I've used to describe it is we don't say that Russian roulette is safe because it only kills one person at the party. <laughs> Yeah. right yeah um but i think that in the church for a lot of people especially people who have been raised and you know have have been steeped in these churches where they they tend to promote these more you know harmful books because they all tend to have a very similar um theological zeitgeist they all tend to be in the same group um, I think that if all the parties you've ever been to only ever play Russian roulette, you just kind of think that's how life works, right? You don't realize that some people are playing charades. Um, and so when you think of a game, it's like, well, there, that's just how, what happens? You go to the party and one person dies and you just kind of hope it isn't you. And it's like, no, all the rest of us are like, no, there are people playing Scrabble and charades and dictionary. What are you doing? Yeah, but five people had fun. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And I think that's, that's just what I want this to be seen as is like, these books are Russian roulette with mm -hmm. the emotion, with, 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 um, vulnerable people, mm -hmm. you know, yes. it's, I don't know it's, how hard it is to review the books that have already been put out, you know, to, to make the edits Well, first change the heart of the individuals that wrote them to make the necessary edits and, and, and reissue or take them out of print. I don't know how hard that is. You know, but, yeah. I, I, you know, 
I, I recently asked for two of my oldest books that I published back in 2003 and 2004 to be taken out of print because I can't stand behind them anymore. And it's not that I think they're terrible books. I don't. It's just there's one or two things I said. You know, I like 98% of it, but there's just that 2% that I just wish I had phrased differently and I'm not comfortable with. And so I asked for them to come out of print. I've got lots of other stuff that's that's healthier. It doesn't need to be out there anymore. And And I just hope that other people have the same attitude. And, mm. and we'll have some humility here because our reputation as teachers is not more important than the well-being of the sheep. Uh -huh. And I think that, that a lot of people are getting upset because we're criticizing other authors. But, you know, the main, the victim here is not the authors we're criticizing. The victims are the people that have been hurt. Right. And we need to get the focus back in the right place. Yeah. yeah. So last question for uh, Miss Joanna. Um, I know that uh, you're mm -hmm. kind of in the in the back there watching the kids, perhaps. But uh, any any last thoughts? What's what's what are you seeing on your side from a public health and policy side? Yeah, I'm really encouraged. I think one of the things that's been happening behind the scenes over the last few weeks is that we've been talking to a variety of academics about getting our work out there in peer-reviewed journals, which is yes, really important, that. we think, that yeah. Christian books that say that they're based on research should be going through the hoops to get peer-reviewed, because that means that they're standing the test. And we haven't done that yet. We're working on it so hard. Um, we've gotten ethics approval, and then we're going to be submitting to journals in, in the next couple of months. Um, but we just think that's really important. And I'm so encouraged by the conversations that we're having, um, specifically with pelvic floor physiotherapists who are often on the front lines treating sexual pain disorders, about how they can apply what we're finding here um, to their clinical practice, especially the stuff about consent. Actually, that's been something that's really encouraging um, for them. So they, they, they're thinking about some, some screening questions that they can use specifically about consent. And that is really encouraging for me to, to be able to see something that's really tangible coming from our work. Um, and additionally, as the mom of two little girls, uh, I am just like Rebecca, really hopeful that they grow up in a church that sees them as people, mm -hmm. first and foremost, that they are seen as being image bearers of God and yeah. that they aren't seen as a threat or right. as if they're being female at the boys at youth group, that they're just seen as people. Um, yeah, I'm really, it's, it's been a tough, uh, it's not fun to get threats from other people. It's not fun to deal with drama behind the scenes, but I'm also so encouraged by the responses that we're getting from readers mm -hmm. and um I'm very hopeful about the future as we, we kind of are, are, are getting this book and this message out there. Mm -hmm. Well, I just wanna say thank you for, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for writing this book. Um, I have heard about a number of these books. I, I, I have, I think two of them in my library. And <laughs> as, as we said, there are you know good qualities to different parts of these books, but I think as we said, if it's Russian roulette, then we need to be very wary of that. So I think your book is, is not just something that you're trying to pick a bone with, you know, right. various authors out there. I think you've taken some of your books off, out of print, as you mentioned, uh, because you didn't want to have even a small uh, hint of something that could cause harm. And so I hope that uh, definitely uh, those watching will definitely check out this book um, and definitely share it with those, you know, in your lives. Mm -hmm. I know I also want to thank Angela for coming on. I know it's a little bit awkward to be uh, having this <laughs> conversation. <laughs> oh, it's great. Uh, thank you, Toma. You guys uh, handled it so well, too. I will say we're <laughs> used to it. All yeah. the three of us yeah. are used to it at this point. Right. Yeah. yeah, we know this is so outside the comfort zone of many, <laughs> many <laughs> podcasts. Well, I love your podcast, too. I've been listening to that the last couple of weeks, too. So oh, thank you. It's been great. <laughs> So again, uh, th thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please click like and consider subscribing to the channel. Thank you.